So hi again, everyone. My name is Aristotle with Real Wealth. Thanks for joining us on our Educational Thursday webinar. And today we're talking about building long-term wealth with a 1031 exchange. Uh, 1031 exchange is, uh, if you haven't heard of it, you're gonna learn a lot today, but it's an amazing tool uh, to use to defer capital gains on a rental property or an income property. So whether you have a single family home, a commercial property, uh, anything that's an income property, technically, we'll, Mike will go through that today, um, will qualify for an exchange and you can defer the gain. So people will use this tactic to not only defer capital gains, but also to increase your net worth and also increase your cash flow. So let's say, for example, you are you have a single family home you've owned for maybe five or 10 years. You're, you've accrued a lot of equity in there, but the cash flow is just not there. You don't want to just sell it and cash out because you're going to be paying Uncle Sam a lot of taxes. It's just not the smart thing to do unless, again, you have some obligation to, to do so. But the, be the better thing to do is do what's called a 1031 exchange, sell that property, get into something else that's going to cash flow, hopefully more and increase your net worth. So uh, today we have Mike Auerbach from 1031 Specialist on the call today. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Thanks for uh, having me here, Style. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I know. We're excited. This is the first time you've been on one of our webinars, so we're super excited to have you on and talk about this topic. Uh, we don't talk about it enough, and going into spring and summertime is when a lot of people think about selling properties, or whether it's a rental property or rental properties in general, and so this is really good timing. So before we dive into today's webinar, uh, one quick thing uh, for any for whoever's attending, on the top right there, you'll see there's a chat box or question box. As we're going through the presentation, feel free to write any question down that you would like us to a uh, answer because at the end of the presentation, we're gonna try to get through as many questions as we can. So again, feel free to do that. Uh, Mike, if you can go to the advance on the next slide, we'll go ahead and get started with a couple of things before we get into your presentation. All right, this is our huge live event, right? Everyone's been asking us for live events. We did one last October, I think it was October, yeah, in, uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles. This one's gonna be in South San Francisco. So uh, join us for that Saturday, May 4th, from 8.30 to 6, it's gonna be a packed day. We're gonna have property teams. We're gonna have uh, lenders and insurance companies, et cetera. They're all gonna be there uh, to answer questions. And Kathy and Rich will be there speaking. And it's just gonna be a great event. And uh, like it says there, we have our teams from Jacksonville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Dallas, and San Antonio are gonna be there presenting as well. So if you live in the area or if you live close to the West Coast, sign up on our uh, realty.realwealth.com and go ahead and, and uh, get signed up for that. All right, I think the next slide is our disclaimer, which I'm gonna read here when it comes up. Sorry, it's a little slow here today. Uh, I'm not gonna read it word for word, but it basically says that the strategies mentioned in this presentation may not be appropriate for everyone. Uh, you know, seek a CPA or a tax accountant for legal questions. We, we cannot answer legal questions. Um, it also says that past performance is no guarantee of future results. Uh, just like anything in life, you know, there, there's always risks. And so again, seek out an attorney or CPA if you are looking for legal advice. Go ahead to the next slide. And I think we're gonna dive into your presentation, Mike. Great. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, so take it over, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks again, Aristotle, for, for having me. Um, you know, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Auerbach. I'm a partner here at 1031 Specialist. We're a qualified intermediary, also known as a combinator on the West Coast. Um, helping clients defer taxes and maximize gains on their real estate. So a little bit about me, um, you know, I started my career around 10 years ago in the commercial real estate space. I've been around a billion dollars worth of transactions, first as a commercial investment sale advisors to owners. Uh, and later I worked at a company called Bascom, acquiring value add multifamily properties and really understanding and utilizing the 1031 exchange to compound and expand our portfolio all right so here's what we're going to cover today uh and here's a quick rundown so first i'm going to touch a little bit on the 1031 basics next i'm going to discuss the, the criteria and whether some are not qualifies to do a 1031 transaction um, then i'm going to show you guys the real magic of using 1031 exchanges to compound your gains tax-free and you know, I'm gonna give you some tips on the best planning and strategies to have a successful outcome. And finally, just touch a little bit on, on who we are. And like Aristotle said, I'll be sure to leave ample time for a Q&A. So let's dive into the uh, 1031 basics. So you know, the big question, what is a 1031 exchange? Well, simply put, a 1031 exchange is the swap of one investment property simply for another like-kind investment property without paying tax. Really what it means, guys, is 
one investment property for another investment property. You can kind of think of it as just removing the word like kind. 1031 exchanges have been around for more than 100 years. And I want you guys to really think that a, a 1031 transaction is really like a normal real estate transaction, um, except for a couple key differences. First, you know, an investor must use something called a qualified intermediary or also known as an accommodator. Um, a qualified intermediary is an independent third party mandated by the IRS to facilitate 1031 exchanges. And second, um, as an investor, you cannot take any constructive receipt of your funds for, e for even a second. Um, you know, let's take a look at the graph here real quick. Um, it's going to really show you the mechanics of a 1031 transaction and, and how the process really plays out. So first, as the investor, you know, you're going to sign an agreement with a qualified intermediary. The qualified intermediary really is going to direct the proceeds from your relinquished property or the property that you're selling to a partner bank where the funds will sit in a segregated trust account in your name or your entity's name. When it's time to close on the replacement property, your qualified intermediary will direct those funds from the bank to the seller of the replacement property that you're buying, thus completing the 1031 exchange transaction. Great. So there are three primary types of 1031 exchanges, the forward, the reverse, the improvement exchange. There's also something called the simultaneous exchange, but those, in, those are less and less rare. I'd say the majority of 1031 exchanges done today are, are, are primary forward exchanges. So simply put, you know, the forward exchange is when an investor sells a property first and then and buys, you know, a second one in um, 180 days. These timelines are firm. Um, the time the timeline starts, if you look at this um, graphic right here, on the day that you sell your the relinquished property, the property that you're selling, you're then gonna have 45 days to identify the replacement property or properties, and you must complete you know, the transaction with 180 days. These deadlines are firm, guys, no matter if it's on a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday, and there's something that you really have to pay attention to. Next uh, is the reverse exchange. Um, typically, the reverse is just opposite of that. You buy a property first, and then you sell a property in your portfolio that will satisfy the exchange. Same six-month timeline. You know, a lot of our family office clients tend to uh, do reverse exchanges just because they're really well capitalized. And finally, you know, we've got the improvement exchange, um, where an investor uses equity from the property that they're selling to improve on the replacement property. And that's, this must be done also in 180, 180 days too. But I think really the most important part here is, you know, what exchange you guys choose really boils down to your capital uh, timing and, and, and strategy. Sorry about that. So, you know, here's the great thing, in my opinion, about 10, you know, using the 1031 exchange is that you have nearly infinite exchange options. You can extend, you can exchange raw land for a rental home, a shopping center for an apartment building, or you can diversify, you know, an office building into multiple rental properties. There are more than 16 different types of real estate, all illustrated here, that you can swap in and out of. And the best thing is, is that, you know, you can do this as long as they're in any U.S. city or town in the in the U.S. and you know, this is eligible for all real estate investment properties for, you know, real estate or business purposes. Um, you know, further, I think it's really great, you know, as the, you know, the market changes, you can, you know, consolidate a bunch of properties into one, or you can go from one property into multiple properties. So it allows you to diversify in a way where, you know, it, it uh, matches up to your, um, you know, your investment uh, criteria. So the, the main question is, you know, do I qualify or, you know, how are you, will you not be disqualified from doing a 1031 exchange? I'll tell you that, you know, most every real estate investor is qualified. Um, and let's get into that real quick. So you must pass three tests in order to qualify for a 1031 exchange. First, the who you are test. You can't be a flipper or developer. You must be a real estate investor. Second, the what you own test, I, I, I talked about this a little bit, you must own US held real estate for business or investment purposes. And finally, the when you bought a test, generally speaking, you know, it's it's over two years, but you know, really it could be, you know, around a year, let's just call it. Um, there's different scenarios where, you know, you're eligible to 1031 sooner than that. And, you know, we can get into that on a case by case basis. 
So, you know, like your personal taxes, guys, the IRS relies upon an honor code system and trouble really only comes knocking if, you know, the IRS, you know, comes knocking at your door. And if that happens, they're going to look at the facts and circumstances of your case and they're going to look at, you know, an area known as intent. And, you know, intent really just means why or why not did you buy the property and what did you have planned for it? And, you know, if we look at this graph right here, you know, here's the intention of being an investor. Typically, an investor buys a property that has a tenant in the property and collects their income from, you know, having their tenant sign a lease. When you're doing a flip or, you know, or being a developer, typically, you know, those types of people have inventory held for sale in their books. They're going to derive most of the economics from, you know, just, you know, profiting from the sale and they don't collect any income in between. Um, you know, I would say that if you guys have questions about like if you're considered a flipper or developer, I'm happy to go through that, you know, during during our Q&A. So, you know, I think what's really great and what's apparent to me is the 1031 exchange really is the eighth wonder of the world when it comes to real estate investing. And it's literally a, a gift given by our, our government to real estate investors. And I'm going to show you here why in a second. So, you know. What's the point of doing a 1031 exchange, right? Like what's 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 the magic of it? So the true power of a 1031 exchange is really for the ability for an investor to meet their investment objectives without losing equity or taxation. Just think about it for a second. With more money, you'll be able to buy multiple, larger, more productive properties. You know, let's take a quick look at this example here. Um, you know, consider you guys are selling an investment property and you've got five hundred thousand dollars of equity left after um, you know your sale. You see the two columns here in the in the middle. Um, the one on the left is doing a ten thirty one exchange, and the one on the right is not doing an exchange. So if you do a ten thirty one exchange, you're going to have no you're going to you're going to defer capital gains tax, and you're going to have no tax exposure. But if you don't, you're going to have, you know, a, around a $65,000 tax hit. So when it comes time to reinvest, you know, you'll have $500,000 doing a 1031 exchange versus $435,000 not doing a 1031 exchange. $65,000 doesn't seem like, you know, that big of a difference. I mean, it is a lot of money, but here's where it really gets interesting. When it, it comes time to reinvest those proceeds, and let's just assume, you know, 20% down for a second. By doing a 1031 exchange, you'll be able to afford a two and a half million dollar property. And by not doing a 1031 exchange, you'll only be able to afford a property worth, you know, two million one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. So the single difference in this transaction is three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. That three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars gets you more property, more diversification, more bonus appreciation and most importantly, more cash flow. But. You know, that's just the power of one transaction. What if during your investing career, you know, you did multiple transactions and, you know, in this scenario, we're using, you know, the same starting equity, the same return on equity, which is 50%. The only difference between the middle column and the column on the right is deciding to do a 1031 or not. You know, if you guys, you know, if you guys go to um, transaction 10, you know, which is highlighted, you know, someone who does a, a 1031 uh, exchange with 10 transactions in a row, they will have amassed $5.766 million. And let's just say someone who decides to do those same 10 transactions and pay the 30% tax each time, by transaction 10, they will have only amassed, you know, a little bit over $2 million. So, you know, what's what's the point? Well, the difference in doing a 1031 exchange in this example is, you know, you'll be nearly $3.75 million richer choosing to utilize the 1031 exchange versus not using it, utilize the 1031 exchange. But this is where it gets a little bit crazier. You know, I know some people who've been doing, you know, who do 20 transactions over their investment career, and it's really not that, you know, uncommon for someone to do that over a 40 or 50 year period. In this example, you know, someone who just does a 1031 versus someone who doesn't do a 1031, they will have been $292 million richer utilizing the 1031 exchange versus not utilizing the 1031 exchange. Guys, this is the real power of uh, 1031 exchanges and the magic of compounding. So, you know, 
here's the great thing about 1031 exchanges. There's no limit to the amount of time someone can exchange. That's kind of why the grandmasters keep, you know, exchanging. The, the way it works is, you know, when your time on earth is up and your kids inherit your property, your kids will get a step up in basis and all the appreciation that you made happen, they won't have to pay a dime in tax. So this is kind of what we mean in the industry when we say swap to you drop and the benefits are enormous and you can continue to do this, you know, your entire life. So, you know, let's say you're thinking about doing a 1031 exchange, you're going to sell your property, you've made the smart decision to hire 1031 specialists. This is the time for winning. This is the time for planning. Let's go through how, you know, you're going to win. You know, first I want to acknowledge a couple of things, a couple of things, you know, there are some challenges in do, to doing 1031 exchanges. And we do hear, you know, some outside noise about some of the two big objections in doing a 1031 exchange. First, you know, it kind of feels like I've got a gun to my head as far as timelines are concerned. I'm not going to have enough time to identify my replacement property. We hear that all the time. And second, you know, 1031s inherently cause you to overpay for your properties. You know, let's address each here, you know, real quick. So, you know, while it is true, the main challenge to doing 1031 transactions is the clock is always ticking. And, you know, you have to ad adhere by the strict timelines. You've got 45 days from the time your property closes to identify three properties, you know, to identify property or properties. And then you've got 180 days to, um, you know, close on the transaction, regardless of with it, whether it's on a a Saturday, Sunday, a holiday, these deadlines are firm no matter what. And finally, you know, we feel like, you know, there's really no excuse to, you know, not have enough time to line things up properly before, you know, the 45 day clock even starts. So these are some strategies that we implore our clients to utilize so we can plan and mitigate any risk that comes inherently with doing a 1031. So, you know, before the 45 day clock even starts, you know, you guys can do the following. First, you can have your broker shortlist 10 properties for you. You can actually go out and identify your replacement property or properties. And, you know, a lot of times, sometimes people actually enter into an option contract with, um, you know, other owners to buy their, you know, to, to buy their replacement property. And then, you know, people also put their target property or properties under contract, assuming they don't go hard, of course, we don't want your money at risk or anything. Um, or you can do a reverse exchange, which is when you buy first and then you sell one of your properties to satisfy the exchange requirement. You know, look, you know, I'm, I, I understand the reality of planning is really hard. It takes a lot of work, especially maybe in, in this market to find deals that meet your investment criteria. But consider the alternative for a second. The alternative is taking a 30% tax hit, which is a huge, huge risk. And, you know, in my opinion, like, why not do the hard work up front and compound tax free? Hey, Mike, can I say something real quick? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the great things about real wealth is that we, all the properties that are available through our different property teams are first come first serve. So we don't act as a tr traditional brokerage where you have to make offers and right now well for the last several years in this crazy across the united states it's been crazy with multiple offers on properties but the great thing about our company is why people love doing 1031s with us is because we have new construction homes that are that you can identify we have turnkey homes um, and there's no bidding warrants so offers come first serve so if it's available you just request it you tell mike or your company that you want to you know that's your property you got to identify it's that simple. You don't have to worry about making offers with other investors. So we, we also make it very simple. Yeah, I mean, that is the the biggest, you know, risk that a lot of folks have is identifying those investment properties or finding them. And for you guys to pr provide the solution and make it seamless in a one stop shop, that is truly, you know, mitigating all potential risk in doing these things. And, you know, that's that's a real advantage that that you guys have. So that's, you know, add that to the list of planning to win. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I want to address, you know, the narrative out there that 1031s cause you to overpay. Um, you know, we left this page blank, you know, intentionally because no one really needs to know that you guys as investors are 1031 buyers. There's no 
section in the IRS section 1031 tax code that says you have to, you know, identify yourself as a 1031 exchange buyer. And really the only people that need to know are maybe your your legal advisors, your qualified intermediary. So, you know, what we like to tell people is, you know, I kind of find it's kind of comical and ridiculous that says like, hey, you have to identify yourself and tell people you're doing a 1031 exchange. You know, you don't have to do that. And, you know, that's why we kind of say, you know, tell no one. So look, you know, 1031 exchanges aren't set up to inherently make you overpay. You know, the people who tend to do that, you know, truthfully are, they may be a little disorganized, you know, so here's our advice to our clients, you know, that we make sure to prevent, you know, any, um, you know, disorganized transactions. You know, first, you know, plan ahead, plan smartly, work with, you know, Aristotle and his team to look for properties that you guys, you know, can identify, have a process to identify properties, um, you know, never let the tax tail on the dog. This is really important. You know, if you're going to buy a property just to save a ton on taxes, you're most likely going to inflict significant financial damage on your portfolio. It's probably best just to opt out and pay the tax. Um, in, in, in our opinion, like we want you guys to have the most successful outcome, but it doesn't make any sense to just, you know, buy not to pay taxes if it doesn't, you know, meet your criteria. And finally, listen to, you know, our friend Keith Wasserman. Keith is the founder of Gelt Properties. He's built, you know, a $2 billion empire. And, you know, Keith says, uh, you know, depreciation and 1031s are the eighth and ninth wonder of the world. Um, you know, and this is a great strategy that a lot of people have been using to uh, compound their wealth. So look, guys, you know, I'm here to help. We've got the best 1031 exchange calculator in the business. It gives you, you know, specific detailed scenario analysis based on, you know, the property that you're selling and the properties that you're buying. I'm, I'm happy to send that out. We've got the best 1031 Bible out there. It's, you know, a, a great resource. It's got pictures, some of the graphs in here with what you can exchange into. It's 95% of anything that you guys need to know about 1031 exchanges. You know, if you guys have questions on a specific exchange, feel free to email me. I'm Mike at 1031 Specialists. And, um, you know, I'm just going to go into a little bit about us real quick. You know, I think first and foremost, like our North Star is really that we want to make sure that you guys have the smoothest, most informative 1031 experience a client can ever have. And really, that means a couple things. One, you know, always support a client's rule, a client's goal. And, and two, never forget rule number one. We kind of ripped that off of Warren Buffett. But I think really the most important thing, guys, is like we want you guys to be educated enough and then you guys can make the decision yourself on whether or not this is a tool that you guys should utilize. Um, and finally, you know, we do business in, in every, you know, U.S. state, state and city all the way from Hawaii to, to New York to Florida, you know, if, if you're exchanging all throughout the U.S., you know, totally doable. And, um, you know, we'd love to, uh, you know, help you guys out. And then I'll, I'll open it up to questions uh, right now. Yeah, thanks. That was a that was a great brief presentation. Um, so, yeah, let's go through a couple questions here. So Laura's asking, can you do a partial 1031 if you are renting out the entire home? Yeah, so it's a, it, that's a great question. So typically, you know, we'll see we'll see investors who do, you know, maybe they'll have a four unit, they'll live in one unit, and then you know they'll essentially, you know, rent out the, the the three units. The same thing could literally be applied to a home, right? If you're renting out like the rooms or the home, as long as the property is investment property, you know, you can do that. You cannot do a 1031 exchange in a personal use property, and so what that means is. There's a 14 day limit for how long you can use, uh, you know, your your property. The IRS will deem it personal use if it's over 14 days. So a lot of people will say, hey, you know, does my vacation home qualify? I, I Airbnb and I rent it out. Sure, you, you can. That'll definitely qualify. But if you spend over two weeks there, the IRS is going to deem that for more personal use and not investment use. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes up often. We've had um, tax ex tax experts on, and we've had people ask the same question, say, hey, I rent my, you know, two rooms out of my house. Does that constitute as a, as a rental property? That gets into, you know, 
tax implications, which you know you're not a tax advisor, I'm not either, but uh, but it, it's but you're saying you're saying it could constitute as a as an income. Property. Yeah, I mean, it, look, I think there's different. Everyone's <laughs> got a specific scenario, right? It, it's 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 a completely gray area. I think we take everything on a case by case basis and look at you know how long you've owned the property, how long you've been doing this, you know, all these other factors that come into play, and you know we're happy to kind of go through that. But you know, generally speaking, it, it's part of a larger conversation that we need to have and. You know, I'm not going to say you can or you can't. It really depends on, you know, your specific, you know, scenario and if you've been doing it for a while or if this is just a recent, you know, endeavor. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Julie's asking, you mentioned earlier, but can you sell a primary residence and invest in, in, a, in a do a 1031 and defer gains? And the answer is no, you cannot. No, right? you, you can't. It's got to be, it's got to be an investment property. Like, you know, an investment property just typically means it's not your homestead. You know, you don't have homestead rights there. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, that is not, not the case. And we get that question, you know, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, obviously when you sell your primary residence, you are, you are excluded after a certain amount of gain that you have to pay, you know, depend if you're married or single and, and every state's, I don't know if it's a national limit or if it's a state, but I think it's a national limit, right? It's like 200,000 if you're single and or 250 for single, 300,000 for married. And five, yeah, two, I think it's 250 and, and 500, oh. but, but, but don't 500. quote me. Oh. Yeah. Don't quote me. I know it's, yeah. I, I think it's something like that, but yeah, like, you know, that you do have tax incentives for just selling your, your property on the gains of your primary and, you know, 1031s are just meant for, you know, investment properties. Okay. Uh, Kathleen says, please discuss a, refer a reverse exchange. So I don't know if you want to briefly talk about she if you, if you want to talk about that again how that works totally yeah so a reverse is when you go out and you buy a property first before selling the property that you're planning to sell and typically you've got to be pretty well capitalized to do that you're going to sell your property first which essentially um you've already you know you've already made the decision what property you're going to buy then you have to identify a property in your portfolio which you'll have 45 days to do that and you'll have to sell your property within, you know, 180 days of closing from the property that you're buying. So it's literally just the opposite of doing, you know, a, a primary exchange, is, which is when you buy, you know, you sell your property first and then and buy second. And, and, and typically, you know, we, we like to we see a lot of family offices do this just because they, they've got a lot of money to do so. Most people have to sell their property first and then use that equity to buy their replacement property. Yeah, if you can do a reverse exchange, it would be nice. But like like you said, a lot of people don't have the capital to do that, but it would be it would definitely be nicer and easier if you could, in my opinion. Um, OK, so. Aziz is asking, what happens if you identify the property within 45 days, but that property does not work out? <laughs> yeah, so you you know typically you identify three property three properties or, or or more. There's different rules, and you know these can't just be properties that uh, you just write down a bunch of random addresses. These have to be real contenders. You got to do the due diligence just like any other real estate deal, and. If your first one doesn't work out, you know, typically you've got two more or, or maybe additional to, um, you know, satisfy your exchange. I will say that if for whatever reason, you know, you start your exchange and you just decide not to go through with it, you know, and it's before that 45 day period, you know, the proceeds, which the qualified intermediaries partner bank holds, you'll get that back on day 46. If it's day 46 and you decide I don't want to do this you'll get the proceeds back on day, you know, 181. So there are some mechanics, you know, and some guidelines there, but typically we only want you guys to put properties where there's a real shot and you guys are excited about buying something. And, you know, you can't just put, you know, three properties that are next to each other because, you know, Aziz, like you said, what if the first one doesn't work out, you're on to the next on the list. Yeah, yeah, good point. That can happen. Uh, as he's also, he's also asking, he or she's also asking, since you are deferring the capital gain tax now, when do you have to pay taxes? You kind of talked about that. Yeah, so you ne you never have to pay taxes if you just keep swapping and swapping. And then eventually, if, you know, your kin inherit it, you know, when your time on earth is done, they'll, you know, they'll get a step up in basis and won't have to pay tax at all. And 
this is a strategy that a lot of folks really utilize when it comes to you know creating generational wealth for their families. I will say that you know that is the true power of doing you know and using a tool like this is to keep deferring and deferring and not just doing it once and paying tax and then you know doing it again. I think if you can start early in your investment career or even later, there's a lot of benefit um, which your family can um, you know definitely you know benefit from you know down the road. Okay, Jim's asking, can you 1031 from a rental property into a syndication? That's a really great question. So you can do something like you can't go into a private fund or be an LP in like a REIT or a private syndication. However, you can go into something called a tenant in common. It's a tick. Some, you know, some deals are set up as tenants in common where the IRS deems it you know, appropriate and allowable because you essentially invest and get a percentage of ownership on the deed. So, you know, if that's a structure, there's a lot of syndication deals set up as tenants in common. They're called ticks. If the, if you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to get offered those, you know, those types of deals, you can 1031 into those, but you cannot do it into a private, you know, syndication or even a public REIT because those are deemed, you know, almost, you know, a REIT's like shares, right? So it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's kind of like our grow development. So we have a separate entity of our company called growdevelopments.com and that's where we do syndications. Uh, but all of our syndications are land development they, and they're private and they don't they don't work for 1031s, unfortunately. We have people ask that all the time and it doesn't work. Um, okay, Andrew's asking, for the exchange is the only requirement the source property has to be owned for more than two years? Yeah, so the, the the property the property that you're that you're selling or the property that you're that you're the property that you're selling it's it's generally you know we recently found out that there's actually no timeline rule when it comes to you know how long you have to hold a property to do a 1031. There are some dynamics in there like if family members are buying each other out, there's a two year you know, rule until they can, you know, ex you know, use that money to exchange. However, like anything else, it's super specific and case by case. But, you know, it, as attorneys and CPAs determine everything, it's really in their eyes. Some attorneys and CPAs will tell you you can't. Some will tell you you can't. We recently got an opinion letter from an attorney who said there's no concrete timeline in terms of when, you know, you can utilize a 1031 exchange. I think it really just comes down to the intention, right? Were you buying it as an investment property or were you buying it as a, you know, short-term fix and flip? Because if, you know, you're buying it as a short-term fix and flip, you can't 1031. But if you were buying it as an investment property and, you know, a tenant was in there and for whatever reason, you didn't, it didn't work out or maybe you got a really great offer after acquiring it, you could 1031 that money. Okay. He's also asking how often per year can you do exchanges? How, I'm sorry, how often what? How often per year can you do it? Like how many times per year? Can for, for the same property or like for, for keep, uh, keep... Yeah, it keep? He didn't say that, but I'm just, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I mean, general. look, I mean, traditionally speaking, right? Like generally speaking, like when you're buying an investment property, like you're buying it for long-term cash flow and typically, typically as an investor, like you find a good deal and you want it to, you know, give you a nice return. So, you know, I can't, I can't really give an answer of, of how many times you can do it or can't do it. I would just say that most people buy a property and typically hold it for at least a couple of years before they decide to even to, to scale up or, you know, to move out of something else. Yeah. It could be like, let's say you own, let's say you have a portfolio of 10 or 15 properties and you've had them for 20 years and you want to start moving them into something else you could do three or four a year if you wanted to exchange oh yeah properties. definitely definitely yeah I, I i i maybe misunderstood the question yeah you can do as many as you want per year you know as long as they're you know different transactions let's say you have a huge portfolio like you know aristotle was mentioning 15 you know rental houses you can do 15 different transactions in the, in the same year right i was more yeah. under the thinking if you started with one can you keep doing it every you know six months or whatever and you know, that's typically not the case, but yeah, you can do multiple. We help clients all the time who are, you know, swapping in and out of different properties and that have, you know, hundreds of properties. Okay. There's a few questions here and I think, I don't know if you are comfortable addressing this, but they're asking like what the cost is and, and can it be paid outside or does that have to be outside the 1031 or how's that paid? 
Totally. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. So we charge 1195, you know, that's our fee. It's pretty de minimis when it comes to 1,000, $1,195, you know, 1200 bucks that gets collected from the, the, the proceeds of when you're selling your property, you know, so it comes out of that closing. We make a, an agreement with our clients to remove any friction just because it's our former roles as brokers and investors, like we all want to be in alignment to make sure you have a successful outcome. So what we've done is if you don't have a successful outcome, you know, closing on a replacement property or for whatever reason, you're like, Hey Mike, actually I don't want to do this or I can't, you know, find anything that meets my criteria. We will refund you the fee. So all of a sudden it's, you know, there's really no reason not to try doing a 1031. There's no investment, you know, risk on your end and, we're trying to make it as smooth and seamless as possible. And, you know, we're one of the only accommodators, qualified intermediaries, intermediaries out there who give you that money back guarantee, which is important to us. Perfect. Good. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, here's a great question. Um, can I do a 1031 exchange on less than value, uh, than, than less than the full value of the sales? For example, my investment property sells for 600000 and I want to exchange to a $300,000 $300, property. So he's going down in value. Does that defer all my gain or half my gain? You can't do that, right? Yeah, it doesn't have to be equal to- It's gotta, be, it's, it's gotta be the full gain. So let's just break it down in, in simple math for a second. Let's say you're selling a property that's a million bucks and you've got $800,000 of equity that you've built up and you've got $200,000 of debt. You're gonna to have to buy a property that's worth at least a million dollars and you're going to have to replace, you know, the, the debt component and the equity component of it to get the full tax deferral. Right. So, you know, if you're like, you know what, I actually want to do the, I want to do a 1031, but I don't want to put debt on the property. In that scenario, you would have to bring an additional $200,000 of cash to satisfy that million dollars of, you know, tax deferral to get the full, you know, amount. So, Great question that that that's that comes up all the time. And, you know, it's the debt and the equity, not just, you know, the equity that you, you know, make from the sale. Yeah, the way I think about it is just like for like, you know, you have to, you know, if you're selling a property for six hundred thousand, you gotta buy something six hundred thousand dollars or higher. You can't go lower. And like you said, the debt, if you have three hundred thousand of debt, you can't you can't you can't go backwards and exchange your property and pay cash for it. You have to get financing equal to the debt, right? So it's kind of like yeah. for like, it's like for like, to, exactly. Yeah, easier to remember that. So, um, okay, let's see a couple more questions here. Can you speak, uh, Christine's asking, can you speak to the chain of title if you plan to follow the swap to you drop strategy? So um, I don't know, um, this, this is actually a question I was gonna talk to you about because this comes up quite often. Let, let's say a husband and wife are on title uh, and let's, let's say, maybe it's a bad example, but let's say they're getting divorced or maybe it's a brother and sister or whatever. And, and they, one wants to sell a property, one doesn't, right? But they're both on title. They both have to do the exchange. Isn't that correct? That, you know, you know, you can, you know, some people can do something called like a, you know, it, it's called like a drop and swap. Like, you know, some people can do a 1031 exchange. Uh, if I'm a, if I'm in a partnership with you, Aristotle, and I want to do a 1031 and, and, and you you know, don't want to, you know, there, there's ways for us to go our separate ways and still do a 1031 exchange. Typically, mm. you know, especially in California, you're going to have to get like an attorney involved before the PSA is even signed. So you can plan ahead to structure, you know, the deal to make sure that you're able to, to be eligible. And that's really important. You know, I just want to also say that any entity can do a 1031 exchange, you know, whether it's a partnership, you know, a single member LLC, you know, the IRS has something called like a, a the same taxpayer requirement for tax for tax tracking. So, you know, if the same person or entity is exchanging, it's it's super easy. If not, you know, we've got a structuring attorney we can bring in and take the right steps to uh, make sure to maintain, you know, your your 1031 eligibility. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. OK, good point, because because that comes up sometimes and. Um, and uh, but that's good to know that you can actually do it a certain way without having the I, uh, get one someone off the title, but like you said, you probably have to get them off the title before you do the PSA or something. So yeah, and that um, happens a lot. I mean, partners break up and you know they dissolve for whatever reason. And you know, again, like it's always you always have to do it prior to a PSA on the sale being signed, 
because you know there, there's some nuance to it. And again, we've got a great attorney that you guys can talk to if you're in that scenario. Okay, great. Can you explain what is meant by boot in the 1031 exchange? What's that word mean? Yeah, boot is you know just just the, the the taxable amount, right? So you could have mortgage boot, you could have you know any anything regarding you know your taxable exposure is kind of known as boot. We've got a great I mentioned we've got a great 1031 exchange calculator. It calculates you know your taxable boot based on you know your property that you're selling and then potentially the property that you're buying, and you know it breaks it all down in an easy concise way. There's a couple inputs based on your, you know, your own specific scenario. And it'll tell you what your, you know, your boot is based on factors like where you live and, you know, how long you've owned the property and, you know, stuff like that. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Rory's asking, can I sell two properties, let's say 500,000 each and buy one property at a million dollars using a 1031? And if yes, what's the process? Yeah, the process is the same as just, just the other pro, you know, just, just like a normal, you know, one for one you know first you gotta make sure that you know both properties are under contract and then you have to identify you know uh, you know a replacement property you know people do that all the time it's a great way to consolidate their portfolio maybe they don't want to manage you know a couple different properties and you know or maybe they want to buy one bigger more productive property we see people do that all the time and you know people also do the reverse right they go from one to to, to two or three just to uh you know, diversify a little bit. So that's pretty common. Yeah, but the trick is you got to get someone who's going to buy both those properties at the same time because you can't just you can't just sell one and then all of a sudden like 30 days or 50 days later sell the other one. That's not going to work. They have to close correct. the same yeah, thing, right? That, yep, correct. That that's that's a great point. Yeah, you have to close on the same, you know, the same day. So typically you'd want someone to buy both of your you know, one guy, one owner to buy both of your properties, um, you know, because again, like Aristotle said, you can't just, you know, sell one and then wait to sell the other one because you got to, uh, you know, you got to have those similar guidelines in the same transaction from going from two to one or one to three or, you know, whatever scenario that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, what, what I'm thinking about doing this year. So I have some older properties in my portfolio and I'm thinking about I've had them for eight or 10 years and I'm thinking about just selling or at least selling one of them uh, and getting into like a new construction house. So I can just not to worry about the older house and the deferred maintenance and stuff like that. And just uh, and, you know, from a cash flow standpoint, I was doing the numbers. It's about the same. It might be a little bit less on a new construction house, but I know what, what I get qualified for for uh, interest rates. But uh, to me, it makes more sense because. Oh. The, the newer home will be valued at a higher price. So my net worth is going to go up a little bit. And, and then the maintenance should be pretty minimal for a long time. And so that's a strategy people use too. It's like not, it, people don't just do exchanges to increase cash flow, right? They do it to for other reasons. Like let's say you have a really old building and it's got a lot of 50 grand worth of stuff you got to do to it. And you're like, I don't want to pay for that. Just find someone to buy it and let them take care of it. And then do an exchange into something that doesn't have much maintenance, hopefully. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like you want to go into essentially more productive properties and more property that probably isn't going to have a higher expense load to you. And, you know, that's why people swap, you know, all the time, as Aristotle mentioned, because, you know, even though the cash flow could be similar, you're going to, you know, have a property that's going to appreciate more and, and have less, you know, maintenance issues down the road. Okay, last question. Uh, Steve asks, can I buy multiple cheaper properties that add up to the value of the property sold? And the answer is yes, you can do that, right? Yes, yeah. As long as, as long as remember, the net proceed amount is at least the same. So, you know, that is totally, totally doable. Yeah. So say, for example, you sell a $400,000 house. Now, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is, you know, how much proceeds you have, right? Because if you, if you sell a $400,000 house and you only have 60,000 with proceeds, you're not going to be able to buy four or $100,000 houses, right? I mean, you can add more to it though, right? You can add more to the exchange. It's It's got to be for at least the, you know, the the amount you're selling. So if you're selling for something that's 400,000, you got to buy something for at least 400,000. You could buy something for 800,000. You'd have to bring more capital to purchase, you know, that additional 400,000. You got to be at least for the you know the price that you're that you're selling because that's what like kind means is at at least the amount of of proceeds that uh, you know you're getting from you know the transaction. 
But like, but say for example, let's say four hundred thousand dollar house, you sell it and you buy, you want to buy four one hundred thousand dollar properties, right? For example, or give or take, just for just a, for a model here. But let's say you only had sixty thousand dollars of proceeds, like to roll into those properties. That's not going to be enough down payment for those all those four properties, right? So would you just have to come out of pocket with your own money? Yeah, you have to come. That's yeah, that, exactly. You have to come out of pocket with additional funds to, uh, you know, make sure that, you know, you can get those properties for, uh, you know, for the full tax deferral. Right, right. OK. OK, well, that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, but if you have any other question, if you go to the next slide, I think it just says thanks for coming if you want to go to the next one. But yeah, if you um, if you don't have Mike's information, you can certainly go to uh, realwealth.com. You can log in. And when you go to the resources page and you look on the under the 1031 exchange uh, or 1031 category, you'll see 1031 specialists there. And there's a link there. You can click on that. and It'll take you right to their website and you can contact Mike that way if you want to. So um, but I appreciate you having you on, Mike. And it was a pleasure speaking with you about all this stuff. Yeah, Aristotle, I appreciate it. Hopefully you guys found this, you know, pretty impactful and, you know, happy to answer any questions. I, I'm Mike at 1031 specialist.com and you know, looking forward to, uh, you know, helping you guys out. Perfect. Thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, guys.